all of you share the experience now of living in exile in the United States. I was curious how that experience has impacted your creative process. Have you changed as a writer as a result of the experience, whether it's your style or your voice or your audience? Um, and perhaps, perhaps we could start with, with Sarah and we could work down. My experience as a writer in exile. I think what this experience has done is that it has broadened the world for me. It has made me see writing as sort of differently from the way I saw it when I was in Swaziland with an audience that's one million people who were talking about the same issues. Coming here introduced me to all these people and some of you, and you know, very good poets like Bridget and playwrights and all this. So as far as just the craft itself, I found myself in a world where there were so many people to work with and for this I am very grateful. But personally then, my own writing, I found that I went into more genres. When I was in Switzerland, I used to work as a journalist it wasn't something I could do anymore in the same manner because the messages that I had for that population were sort of different. So I ventured more into poetry, also with the help that I got from you all, even producing that uh, anthology. And then I've just gone on in poetry much more than the others, except that in Switzerland I've kept the connection of uh, high school prose that's used in the schools because the editor that I had then has always just asked me to please do something, you know. So I've really thought a lot about what I want to do with the youth there and written short stories for them where I realized that they're in a situation that's closed. The question of a voice, a people's voice, has been a big question for me. I can be out here and speak, but it doesn't get to Swaziland the same way as it would if I was there. And then the biggest question is, being away from that situation, I had a chance to think about why my people are voiceless. Why is this voicelessness continuing? And I think, thinking by myself, I cannot answer that question, but I can just make allusions to why I think it is. Which is why then when I write for the youth, when I'm here, I'm comparing, you know, even themes in young adult literature here and saying, I need to say this to them. I need to say this to them. What are they going to say? There hasn't been much feedback except that a few of them who go to Facebook will say, oh, is that you? Thank you for writing this and stuff like that. But the truth of the question remains. Swazi people do not have a voice. Even when I was there, I knew that. That's why I would walk with a piece of writing and ask anyone to say something, we, you know, in a way that they will feel that it's coming from inside them. So that has been my question all along. I feel there's still a need to go there and just create the space until people learn that they have a right a right to feel the dignity and feel that their identity is dignified and that their freedom is theirs and that the voice is theirs and that the stories that are in the place can be told by them as much as they can be told by anyone. So that's all I could say. One of the things I think is really interesting when I look at all your backgrounds is that many of you have a background in journalism as well as having a creative background as well. I mean, that's certainly true in, in your case. Um, I mean, have you found that your style has changed since you have been in the United States? Um, do you see any differences in your writing now compared to when you first arrived here? Yeah, I mean, it'll be a bit difficult for me to <laughs> assess it myself, but I mean, I think I, I agree with uh, what was just said, and I'm, I can't match the passion and eloquence uh, <laughs> the way it was articulated. But I think, um, I think there, there are two uh, uh, important elements. One is, of course, uh, the, uh, your voice as a writer or as someone you express, and your, uh, the other is your identity. In Pakistan, for example, when I ventured into public arena and journalism, 
and I was often listed as the secularist, you know, this sort of anti-Muslim, anti-Islam persona, and that's why perhaps the extremists came after me. So all of that happened, and I came here, and thank God I'm alive, but here I find myself located in a, in a totally different category, particularly in the last one year, what's been happening in the US. So I've been increasingly finding myself, you know, apologizing and in fact defending uh, that not 1.6 billion Muslims are terrorists, often not, not just on social media, but also in the, at various events I go to. And so it's become a really kind of a, an, an, uh, a, a reversal of who I was as a, as a political activist, because I mean, in my country, I was highlighting uh, what extremists were doing to non-Muslims. And here I have to now highlight and take on this mantle of defender of Muslims in the US. So it's a bit exhausting, you know? And so the, so, so the writing also then gets that, that craft also undergoes that, uh, that particular process. So I feel that now I write, I write with far greater responsibility because I feel that, you know, I would be read here. And if I were to say, make a loose statement about Islam or Muslims, it would feed into Mr. Trump and his brigade or, uh, or it would incite some sort of hatred but in a way, that, that also fits into what you said, it's, it's broadened. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that experience of writing and, and perceiving, and that's why in my memoir, what I'm writing, I'm, I'm, it's, it, it's taking me so long because I really want to keep this balance that I don't want to uh, be, uh, be uh, seen as a self-hating Muslim. You know, like a lot of characters are, are here who write, you know, I'm an infidel and, you know, kill me, and then their books sell in millions, you know or you know, and why I left Islam, why I became an atheist, why I'm not a Muslim anymore. I don't want to be like that because you know, it's part of my identity, it'll never go away. Even if I believe or practice or don't practice, I grew up in that whole culture. It's a cultural issue. So I feel that you know, I uh, have to keep that balance. I must retain my authenticity as, and my, my essential beliefs. At the same time, I must not become a political object. So this, I guess the same question to you. I mean, have you found that your experience of, of living here has changed your creative process in any way? Well, certainly my metaphor has changed. There's a certain terms of reference, maybe frames of reference can change because you're looking uh, to the immediate when you're writing or creating. Um, uh, and, I, and I realized that in, in Sri Lanka, I was a lot more strident because I was working in a very, very suppressive uh, atmosphere and, and there was a culture of impunity that was so pervasive that you had to shout. So I found myself shouting in my writing and being really strident. So when I came here and I was able to step back from that, I realized that I was becoming a lot more tempered and circumspect. And I understand very much what Raza is saying about being protect or being very careful because uh, because of this whole migration issue and all of that, I tend also now to be a little more circumspect when I write mm -hmm. and be, uh, be protective even, mm -hmm. which, is, which is something I wouldn't do uh, when I, if yeah. I was in, in Sri Lanka and I would just, just say, say, say what I had to say and you know, be very, very critical about your own country because the, the reason that you do that is not because you hate your country, it's because you love your country mm -hmm. and you want it to be a better place, uh, but you know, for that we were we were called uh, traitors. But yeah. We, 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 Likewise. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do you find that that's true of your journalistic writing as well as your creative writing? That you have that circumspection? Yes, I'm a lot more careful about the words I use. So I, I there, there has been a change, and it's and I've done a lot of self-reflective. Um, I've done poetry, which I didn't do. That I was, I was very strident mm -hmm. because as a public. Uh, defender of human rights and as a human rights activist and a journalist, you have to be strident or you're not going to be heard, uh, you know, with, with all that noise and all that impunity that was going on and the fear mongering that was going on. Mm. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Pink, how has the experience of exile impacted your creative process? Uh, I'm sorry, my English is not my. I asked my wife to translate later. Uh, 
就也也被抓进监狱了。他们的命运如何也也不知道，有可能当时都大家每个人都是非常的苦。I left China after 1989 and after the democratic movement in Tiananmen Square. And at that time, uh, in China, the, the situation is very terrible. And a lot of his, uh, my friends was killed and uh, persecuted and arrested. And uh, I worried their <coughs> situation now and uh, I don't know some happened uh, with them. <coughs> After he left China, first Poland, and then moved to US, my first feeling is eventually I do not feel the fear anymore. And second is uh, very exciting. Uh, first time I have freedom to write, to think. Mm. And before, when I was in China, I did not write much political stuff because I was in danger. But after that, I have a really, really good time in the U.S. to write something I do want to write. And I can represent it as my friend and some writer and say something, write something for them. I cannot write now in China. So I really, really appreciate the time I stay here. Yeah, well, then you see, friends, not only my friend, friend, friend talk to me. Yi Ping, you are good at poetry and drama and literature, but I do want to write those things they suggest. But for me, I think the important thing is to write some political about critics like Chinese government. And because in China, there's no free voice can speak those political some opinion. And now I have freedom, I have the right. And I have the chance to write and speak, so I should do this. I contribute most of my energy time to just focus on the political writing and help my friends. You hear a lot about China in the news and all the changes that are happening in China with industrialization and, and whatnot. So what's the current state of, of writing in China? After the Tiananmen Square movement, the couple of years, the political control was very terrible. But later, government changed, like Jiang Zemin and Wu Jintao. The situation relatively changed better and get loose and uh, some kind of freedom. But recently, the new regime and the government, they were born the year like our age. And they were cultural revolution. They were so-called red guards. And their parents were the high rank of government uh, leader. So they want to protect their, their right, their, their power and uh, censorship make the situation worse. So we cannot say it changed. It's we, we don't say the, the economic change, but for the political situation, we didn't say any bad. Um, how about in Sri Lanka? I bring glad tidings of great joy. <laughs> <laughs> because, because in, um, in January 2015, um, there was an election in which uh, the government changed, um, and it really brought about a change in uh, in the politics of the country. Um, there certainly was freedom to to move to the the, the kind of impunity immediately stops the uh, stop. The new president said he's going to curtail his powers, and immediately we had. Um, some uh, bills passed in Parliament, and I'm happy to say we fought for the Freedom of Information Act for 17 years. Three months ago, it was passed. Oh. Uh, some good things happening right now. It's up to us, of course, to keep that momentum going. But I think right now we seem to be sort of the brightest star in that region. I mean, I work at the UN and I, I feel that palpably 
how the international community has changed how they view us. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, good things are happening. We are, we are do, doing. Um, uh, there are other things with transitional justice. Um, I don't know if you know, but we had a, a civil war for um, uh, for 27 years. So there's um, a transitional justice process that's also taking place under the four pillars of truth, justice, uh, reparations, and non-recurrence. We have already set up a missing persons office together with the ICRC. So there are things that are happening for the better. It's of course this thing. We need to keep that momentum going. Mm -hmm. But yes, I, I do have some good news. Some positive signs. <laughs> yes, some positive signs, yeah. Um, how about Pakistan? It's, it's a mixed and a paradoxical situation because historically censorship has been very high in Pakistan because of the military regimes. And the papers and television were, uh, you know, uh, channels were never free. But in the recent years, in the last decade or so, there has been opening up, but there are certain red lines which you can't cross. So you can't really criticize the military, you can't really uh, criticize the operations of intelligence agencies, and national security um, is like a no-go area for most journalists. You have to stick to the state version, and actually I realize it's quite the same in mainstream media in the US. You can't really uh, challenge a lot of national security issues. But then the added problem, uh, which is different from the US, is that we have these non-state actors, the militias, you know, the religious uh, militias and other groups who also take, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, take action against journalists and writers and human rights def defenders. And they unfortunately uh, operate because the state is weak mm -hmm. and the state cannot really enforce its writ and uh, bring uh, those perpetrators to justice. Do you find that you still struggle with ongoing censorship, your works? Less so, because I'm here, so I have a kind of a false sense of security. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, obviously when talking about the military and the intelligence uh, outfits, and, and in particular Pakistan is such a messed up situation with Afghanistan, with India, with the relations with the US. So you have to be very careful, because I'm here, so as Honali used the word, tra uh, word traitor, you know, so once you leave the country, you are immediately la labeled as somebody who's left, you know, because somehow, you live in your country and, and get uh, death or bullets, and somehow that's being patriotic. It's, it's, it's very perverse in my dictionary. But, uh, but uh, so anyway, I've, I've uh, defied that uh, norm of patriotism. So, uh, so I am very careful uh, with what I say, but less so if I were in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. How about you, Sarah? Found that, um, the state of writing in Swaziland at the moment, the freedom to write? I think in Swaziland, it's not really an obvious absence of freedom to write as much as just the political system being such that political parties are banned. So you, the people don't have a space to speak to power from, you know. So basically what's happened with journalists, they've imprisoned some of them and some have died in prison. They've imprisoned Big Mark, who I'm just trying to think of the most prominent ones. You know, I can think of about two that have been imprisoned. They stayed in prison together with the leaders of the political parties. And then after say maybe a year, they freed them just to show that they don't want people speaking. But these are people who are journalists who, for instance, speak <coughs> through a, a, a paper called The Nation. The rest of the people are not allowed to have political gatherings of any sort. So what they were doing was like, um, what you call geographies of resistance, like, because the country is small, go to South Africa and have a meeting there, and then come back, you know. So those things are still going on because the king will not allow political parties. He just wants the system that is there, which is called Dingundla, which doesn't allow people to have parties. They just want people to be subsumed under one organization and then, you know, be... You have 20 people that are chosen by the king to go into government and they must choose from those, what they call a, an electoral college, you know. So basically, 
you don't have a law that says don't speak. You just have political parties are banned, political meetings are not supposed to be had, mm -hmm. and then journalists who speak up are, are, are arrested. So and that hasn't changed. I mean, so what would, what would have to change to improve? Yeah, we need reform, especially a reform where people could form parties and be free to speak wherever, you know. Mm -hmm. Because like now, you can't have a, a gathering like this as long as we're, we're discussing politics. The police can arrest us. You know, so those groups that are there, like the Women's ANC, the NNLC, the Swaziland National Liberation Movement, they are there, but they will just maybe hold a rally, but they can't speak and not and not be arrested. If they are arrested, it's like they've broken the law, and that's it. You know, so what's needed is a system, is a change of government, basically, where political parties can be. People, where people can just form political parties and speak what they want to speak. I'm not sure if Swazis really see the monarchy as an obstacle, if all of them see the monarchy as an obstacle. That's why I personally feel that there is more need to teach people to speak so that they can learn to question and even question the very structure itself. Because it's the only one we've had over the years. So there is so much um, apathy, in my opinion. Do you have any optimism about the future, that those changes could happen? I feel that if we work with the youth, we can get somewhere. I feel that if we work with the youth and create spaces where they can learn the power of their voice, because they do form organizations, you know, but they are not being listened to much by the outside world. So after some time, the impetus goes down and we are always just working on it. So I do see hope, but I see that a lot of work is needed in terms of civil action as well, just people understanding what is it that you do when you look at the actions in your country and the language that you must speak and the language that will address the questions. Mm -hmm. Fellow community members, please join me in a warm and gracious welcome to our guest, Sonali Samata Singhi. Thank you. I am really deeply honored to be a part of these celebrations in remembering one of the greatest spiritual leaders of all time, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I am blessed to be here as you inaugurate for a second term, your first black president. It's a beautiful day in history. Thank you, Don Austin, for that generous introduction. Thank you also to the Greater Ithaca Activity Center, to the Office of Student Engagement and Multicultural Affairs, the Center for Transformative Action, Ithaca College, Cornell University, and all the other organizers of this event. It is significant that I, a South Asian, a Sri Lankan, stand here today with you to honor the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King. My presence here is a testament to the inspiration his life has been, not only to Americans, but to the entire world. Four years ago today, in January 2009, I fled my country. That morning, I had no time to pack suitcases. I was in hiding and running for my life. I left my country with a small hand luggage, but I have a deep love of books. So that morning, as I packed my tiny bag, in which I had hardly any room left, and picked out four small volumes to take with me on this journey into the unknown. A few months after I fled Sri Lanka, I was in New York City, and amidst that glorious feeling of relief and freedom and safety and the hope of new beginnings, I sat down to an early dinner at Ruby Foods restaurant in Times Square. With me, I had a book, 
While waiting for my order, I opened this book gingerly, for its pages were yellowed with age and my fingers trembled, lest I handled it too harshly and the pages crumbled. On the inner page was my father's bold scrawl of a signature. As I started to read, a woman sitting at another table came up to me. Her curiosity had got the better of her. She apologetically excused herself and asked me what it was I was reading and why I was handling this book so carefully. Is it some sort of ancient manuscript? She asked, pointing to the yellowed appearance and the frayed edges of the pages. This book means a great deal to me, I explained. It belonged to my father. It is about a man my father taught me to revere, and it is about a life that has inspired me in my work and in my dreaming. This book, titled What Manner of Man, written by scholar and author Leron Bennett Jr., was the biography of Martin Luther King. And it was one of the four books I had brought with me as I fled my country. Sri Lanka is where I come from. It is a resplendent island in South Asia, endowed with natural beauty and resources beyond measure. From the 1500s, Sri Lanka was invaded and colonized, first by the Portuguese, then by the Dutch, and finally by the British. Sri Lanka is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious country, made up of a majority of about 72% Sinhalese, 12% Tamil, about 8% Muslims, the rest being Burgers and Malay. The Halis are mostly Buddhist, the Tamils are mostly Hindu, and we have about 8% Christians in the country. I am a Sinhalese, and thus I was heir to all the privileges of a majority community. After independence in 1948, the country was marred by race riots, communal violence, and finally, a brutal ethnic war as militant Tamil groups fought for a separate state. This war was fought for 27 years, ending in May 2009. The last years of the war were particularly brutal. International agencies and journalists were denied access to the war zones. The government used scorched earth policies and indiscriminate aerial bombardment. The Sri Lankan government was determined to wage a war without witness. A free press was not encouraged. 19 journalists have been killed in Sri Lanka since 1992. It was in this backdrop that I was a journalist, editor, and lawyer in Sri Lanka. My husband was the editor of one of the two newspapers I worked for. I was the editor of the other. As journalists, we were critics of state-sponsored violence and spoke up for human rights. Week after week, we exposed corruption in government and in military procurements. We spoke out against the colossal loss of innocent life, the vilification of journalists, activists, and human rights defenders, and the abduction and murder of anyone who dared to voice dissent. For this, we were repeatedly threatened. Our newspaper offices had several times been burnt down over a period of years, but we got back up, swept away the ashes, and continued to write and publish. Over the years, our newspaper, newspapers had become a bastion for free speech, and for our audacity, we were now punished. On the morning of January 8, 2009, my husband's car was surrounded by eight assassins on motorcycles, and he was bludgeoned to death. He was on his way to work. It was only by a bizarre twist of fate that I hadn't been with him in the car that morning, having had to attend to a worker at home who had suddenly taken ill. Two weeks after my husband's assassination, I fled Sri Lanka due to threats to my own life. It was impossible to go on. The impunity with which the government was acting was unprecedented. There was no rule of law, and I fled with this, this book. So why this book, tattered and falling apart as it is, why not get a new copy from Amazon.com? As I said, I grew up in a country marred by violence, race riots, and war. One day, when I was about 13 years old, race riots broke out 
yet again. Compelled to stay indoors due to an island-wide state-imposed curfew and told to stay away from the telephone by my parents, I grumbled to my father, as teenagers sometimes do, that I was bored out of my wits and had a good mind to jump curfew and go to a friend's house. My father, a man of discipline and a senior superintendent of police, immediately went to his bookshelf, filled with law books and military books and books on guerrilla warfare, and he picked out this one, biography of Martin Luther King. Read it, he told me, and then let's talk about it. 9,000 miles away from the Lincoln Memorial, in Colombo, Sri Lanka, I read the words, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation but they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I was transfixed. Some years later, my father introduced me to a wonderful movement called Initiatives of Change that based itself on the Gandhian concepts of nonviolence and absolute truth. A movement led in India by Mahatma Gandhi's grandson, Raj Mohan Gandhi. Through the teaching of Gandhi and King, and by their own example, my parents taught me early that above all, we have a responsibility to right the wrongs we see before us. As a senior police officer, my father wielded considerable power. In the late 70s, he was in charge of a large district in central Sri Lanka, where Tamil Singhala ethnic riots had just broken out yet again. The rioters, incensed by hatred, had threatened to kill my father and his family too if he tried to stop the mayhem. My father first declared a district-wide curfew, then he bundled my mom and his three youngest children, including myself, into the police car. And he drove around his district, not only to make sure that there would be no more incidents of violence, but also to help those who were injured. He visited every single home or business premises belonging to Tamils that had been attacked or burnt down by Singhala moms. While traveling, we came across the injured, often beaten to, to within an inch of their lives, lying across, lying on the side of the road. My father would stop, radio for assistance, and stay with them till the ambulance arrived. He was strict and unrelenting with the rioters and compassionate with those who were victimized. Because my father was on the streets himself, supervising his men, it turned out his district had one of the lowest casualty figures. My father led by example. As a police officer during a violent time in our history, my dad faced many challenges, but he refused to compromise his principles or blindly follow orders if they were against his conscience. For this, he suffered greatly in his work, often not given the promotions he de deserved. You may perhaps understand now why this book, tattered and falling apart as it is, is so imbued with so much power and significance. The book's author, Leron Bennett Jr. and Dr. King had been schoolmates and graduates at Mohouse College. The book opens with this wonderful meeting in India between that great teacher of nonviolence revered in South Asia and around the world, Mahatma Gandhi, and a group of African American pilgrims, the year 1929. At this meeting in 1929, Mahatma Gandhi sent a message to the black people of America. Let not the 12 million African Americans be ashamed of the fact that they are the grandchildren of slaves. There is no dishonor in being slaves. There is dishonor in being slave owners. But let us not think of honor or dishonor in connection with the past. Let us realize that the future is with those who would be truthful, pure, and loving. For as the old wise men have said, truth ever is, untruth never was. Love alone binds the truth, and love accrues only to the truly humble. Mahatma Gandhi said, perhaps it will be through the African American that the unadulterated message of nonviolence will be delivered to the world. Dr. King was then six years old. Years later, Martin Luther King Jr. would fulfill 
Gandhi's prophecy. Gandhi's method was to return good for evil, to work for ultimate reconciliation even with your worst opponent, and to openly break unjust laws and be willing to pay the penalty. Rivers of blood, Gandhi said, may have to flow before we gain our freedom, but it must be our blood. Dr. King had come to see early that the Gandhian message of nonviolence was one of the most potent weapons in the struggle for freedom. He was to later write that nonviolent resistance was not a method for cowards. That is what Dr. King taught us. Surely it was a method which my husband believed in too. When people asked my husband why he took such risks and warned him that it was only a matter of time before he would be killed, he would smile and say, it comes with the territory. I know it is in inevitable, but if we do not speak out now, there will be no one left to speak for those who cannot, whether they be ethnic minorities, the disadvantaged, or the persecuted. My husband knew that one day he will have to pay the price. He always said he was ready for that. He did nothing to prevent that outcome. No security, no precautions. He wanted his murderers to know that he was not a coward, hiding behind human shields while condemning thousands of innocent people to their deaths. Yes, nonviolence is not for the coward. But even as we celebrate Dr. King, there are still some 21 million people in forced labor or sexual exploitation around the world. About three people in every thousand are not yet free. These are only the documented. It is estimated there are millions who are not even a statistic. There are 15.4 million refugees in the world today. Last year, 119 journalists were killed around the world. Every time some tragedy takes place, the good among us stand up and say, no, never again, enough is enough. And yet it happens over and over and over again with demonic repetition. Since the Nuremberg trials in 1946, there have been an estimated 80 to 100 million deaths due to war crimes or crimes against humanity. For many, the dream is still to realize. For millions, freedom has yet to come. For thousands, help already came too late. This is not a fight we can fight alone as South Asians or journalists or Buddhists or Hindus or blacks or whites. It is a fight we must fight together as a global community. Because every time a little girl goes to school in Pakistan, each time a child is freed from slavery in a shrimp farm in Bangladesh, every time there is one less stare, one less insensitive remark, one less snub that makes the life of the minority, the other dis disenfranchised, a little less harsh, each time that happens, Dr. King's dream prevails. Just another reason that now is the time to act. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hey. I would like to thank Ithaca Cities of Asylum for helping me to settle down in Ithaca and for recognizing the efforts I put into writing in Swaziland. Swaziland is a very small country and when things happen there, it's very rare for the world to know. So when I'm here and I hear you talking about the work I did there, that's what I mean when I say you move things when you write. Sometimes you are there in Swaziland and you are seeing people suffering. And then the question you ask is, what can I do for the suffering people in front of me? I got to Switzerland in 96. The Swazi people through USID were going to pay for the 60,000 that was used to train me at Michigan State. And when I got there, I found that people were dying of HIV AIDS. I found that for the first time, I was one of those people who are privileged, who have been given the critical eye to see how the society under the monarchy is oppressed. And I didn't know 
what to do. One of the things that intrigued me was how culture is used against the people. How, when you talk about democracy as the government of the people by the people, you had oppression by the monarchy, things to be being done for the monarchy, by the monarchy, and the people being on the receiving hand of nothing. So one of the things I thought about most of the time was, when will this society start talking about itself? When I was at, um, well, just going through my educational life, I remember the book by Hogarth. He said, a society needs to see itself on paper. A society needs to think about itself. And it's in thinking about some of those words and a lot of other things that you learn in this beautiful country that has a good education system that teaches you to see things differently. And then you had all these people grappling with HIV and not knowing what to do. I always believe that the people of Swaziland one day will do something about the system that they live under. But I thought that writers are some of the people who can start making them see things on paper that will make them think, that will make them start asking questions. I'm not the type of person who can go to the street and say this and that, but I think when we write, we make people think. I'm just going to say something that I believe needs to be said, and I will, you won't understand what I'm saying, but when I lift my hand, I'm asking you to say, Hella, right? So you won't understand what I'm doing, and you won't understand what I'm saying. But when I lift my hand, there will be the last word. It goes in, in Zulu and Swazi. There is what we call an idiophone. It imitates what happens. So when something falls, it goes, you know? And then you guys are going to say, hella. Can you say hella? Hella. Again? Hella. Okay. So one of the things people go to watch in Swaziland is to watch the king at the um, ceremony. It's around Christmas time. He's showing people that his, him and his mother, they bring rain. So it's, it usually drizzles in those days. And then he wears all green, and it's supposed to be the feast of the first, first fruits. And he goes all green and he's carrying, a, let's say, a melon for you guys so you can understand because if I say the right word, you'll be lost. So he goes, Vuma panti sigu vene zigi zigi zi, hella. 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 So you can imagine the whole, this is in the cattle by all these people, they are doing exactly the same thing. They change from that and do a lot of other hushed things. And when you look at the, at the pomp, you don't see this pomp. You don't see this aura of power. But that's when you start asking, when will hell mean that this system has to come down? Because it's oppressing the people. So I do believe that if you think about what I'm saying today, you will realize that Swaziland is the last absolute monarchy in the world and a very oppressive system to its people. But the people are holding up the system because of culture. Thank you.